Amen. So keep your place in Ephesians chapter 4. So we're continuing our Good Habits series, and we're going to talk this evening. And for the next two sermons in this series, we're going to start talking about spiritual habits. We're not going to, you know, we talked about some some physical habits, you know, things that you actually do, um, which of course can be spiritual, but we're going to talk about more things that are just spiritual in nature. And this evening we're going to talk about church attendance and the habit of church attendance. So, I mean, just thinking about good spiritual habits, you know, just think about this as we head into these next few sermons. Do you think you have good spiritual habits in your life? You know, we're going to look at church attendance this evening, but we're also going to look at two to three other areas um, in your spiritual life and just kind of do a, a, a test and see where you think you are and how maybe we could improve in some of those areas. But look, um, we'll look at that and then see how we measure up to what the Bible says, basically. Okay. Now look, the kicker behind spiritual things is this. All right, and I don't know, maybe some of you have noticed um, this with me, but turn to Ephesians chapter 4, you're there already, and look at verse uh, number 17. The thing about spiritual things is that they cannot be forced. You cannot force spirituality on somebody, okay? I can't force spirituality on you. I can't, you know, threaten you to become more spiritual, all right, I can't, you know, hold anything over your head or whatever to get you to become more spiritual. Why? Um, well, first of all, it wouldn't be right. Second of all, um, it wouldn't work. It wouldn't work. So look at Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 17. As we're thinking about spiritual things, and we're going to talk specifically about one this evening, look at verse 17 where it says, This I, I say therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as un other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. Now that's, I mean, there's quite a lot right there in those two um, verses. I mean, but, I mean, just one thing that I like to point out, if you look at just the connecting words, the connecting phrase in between verse 17 and verse 18, there's some irony in this verse. It's not the point of the sermon, but there's some irony that basically saying these Gentiles were walking. So we have this cultural shift in, the, uh, in Christianity at this point, right? So Jesus is, is ascended to heaven, and now, you know, these churches are forming, and the Gentiles are being brought in. They're having the gospel preached to them, and, you know, Paul is talking here about the Gentiles coming in. He's like, hey, don't walk how the, the Gentiles walk, in the vanity of their own mind. So they're walking in, you know, this prideful, um, you know, the vanity of their own mind, what they think is right and all this. But the irony is, is verse 18, having their understanding darkened. So they're walking in their lives with, you know, this, this vain mind that's self-focused and they have no understanding because there's no, you know, there's no God there, right? So, I mean, but the point I'm trying to make is if we look at the end of verse 18, having their understanding darkened, so they're, they're foolish. They're not seeing the truth. They're not understanding things. Being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them. So, the, you know, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Amen. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. So these people don't have that, and they're alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of what? Because of the blindness of their hearts. So they were ignorant of the life of God. That's the first problem, these Gentiles. Okay? And then because, why? Because their heart was blind. Their heart was hard towards the Lord. Okay, and then, you know, why? If you, then you can kind of trace it back again to verse 17, and it's because of their walk. It's because of how they were living their lives. They were not living for the Lord. They were living in vanity. Okay, they were living outside of the Lord. So, with these things in mind, you know, spiritual things, spiritual habits, or lack thereof, what I'm trying to get you to understand before we get started here, it's a problem with your heart. It's a problem with the condition of your heart. You say, well, I'm not, uh, you know, this unbeliever. But you, look, you could still have a heart problem that could still cause you spiritual issues in your life. So turn to Hebrews chapter 10. So that's why, look, that's why it can't be forced. Because it's a problem that exists in your own heart. And somebody, look, what do we know about the gospel? I mean, why did God make it by belief alone? Because that's all yours. Your belief is all yours. It's 100% yours. I can't force you to believe anything. Look, I can persuade you. I can do my best 
to persuade you using some pretty wise and knowledgeable counsel, but I can't force you to believe anything. In the same way, I can't force you to be spiritual. I can't force you, as we're going to talk about tonight, to want to come to church. That can't be forced. So look at Hebrews chapter 10 and look at verse number 24. Very, very famous verses here, talking about church attendance and fellowship of believers. In Hebrews chapter 10, look at verse 24. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, as the manner of everyone is now, by the way. But exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Hey, let me just say this. When you're going out soul winning, are you running into anybody that's going to church anymore? No. Nobody's going to church. No, I mean, how do you think, well, you know, good churches, bad churches, we know most of them are not good. But here's the thing. How do you think that this is going to go for most people? I mean, most people didn't want to be in church in the first place. Otherwise, they would have found a church to go to. Okay, but look, this is talking about not forsaking the assembly. This is talking about going to church. In Hebrews chapter 10 and verse number 25, to provoke one another, to exhort one another. You know, here's the thing about church. I don't want to pressure you to come to church. Like, I have zero desire to pressure anybody to come to church. Look, if, if, if you're somebody who really doesn't come to church that much, or sometimes you're in church, and then you're out of church... And, you know, because we have people like this. You know, maybe you're once a month, twice a month, three times a month, depends on the month. Look, I'm not going to hunt you down. I have zero desire to do that. Why? You say, why? I mean, I'm not going to be calling you, hey, you know, trying to convince you to come back to church and all this kind of stuff. Look, I, I love you. Hope you all come to church. But here's the thing. I don't want a church full of people that don't want to be here. I don't want a church full of people that I'm pressuring every single week to be here. I want, you know, you to find out, and what we're going to talk about this evening is, I want you to find out what's keeping you from church. I want you to fix that so you can get to church on your own. So you can come to church on your own. So let me ask you this evening, just think about this in your minds. And I'm going to ask uh, one of the kids a question tonight. So the kids better pay attention, okay? Because I'm going to ask, and I have not... I've not talked to any of the kids before, so I'm taking a risk here because I don't know what they're going to say. But here, let me ask you, everyone in this room tonight, do you like coming to church? Amen. And if not, if not, why? If not, why? So let's do a thought experiment. We're going to look at the kids this evening. Let's do a thought experiment. Now look, I'm going to go out on a limb here, okay? And I'm going to say... I'm going to speak for most of the kids here because I think that most of the kids like coming here. That's what I think. Okay, now I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask Josiah right now. All right, I'm going to ask Josiah. Josiah, and you just, I haven't, Josiah, have I talked to you before the church service about this? Have I talked to you about, you're making me a liar, brother. Have I told you that I'm going to ask you a question? Before church or... Well, during this, okay, all right, I'm sorry, I'm confusing you. All right, Josiah, on a scale of 1 to 10, are you listening? On a scale of 1 to 10, with 1 being, I can't stand church. This guy's lame, I can't stand listening to this guy, it, it's boring, I, I just woke up, I'm sleeping most of the time. Okay, that's 1. 10 is I love church, it's fun, I love coming here. Five's like, yeah, it's kind of okay. So on that scale, Josiah, what would you say is your number as far as church? Ten. Ten. Okay. <laughs> I'm like, this could go really bad. <laughs> okay. So look, but I can tell, I didn't even have to ask Josiah because I can tell. Okay. I can tell that the kids in this church like coming to church. You know how I can tell? Because I'm sitting there and I'm watching the security cameras and I'm going over my sermons before, you know, evening church and before morning church. And I can tell when every family's here because their kids are blasting through the door like two minutes before their parents even come through the door on every family. So I can tell that the kids like coming here. Look, and first of all, that makes me very happy because it makes me feel like we are doing something correct. Okay, but I want to explain what this means for us. Okay, because look, 
it's not all just playtime here. You say they just like coming here because they get to play with all their friends. I want you to think about this for a second. Okay, these kids come to church, and now most people, to you is probably not going to be a big deal. But try to remember if you were saved later in life, if you used to go to a, a false church, or you used to be Catholic, or something else like that. I'll give you my own um, you know, experience on this a little bit later. But just think about what I'm about to say from that perspective, if you can. If you can put yourself in those shoes. These kids, you say, oh, they're just having fun, and we got all this play stuff, and there's toys, and they play chess, and there's a whole play area back here. And I mean, look, that's all true. But these kids, between two services on Sunday and soul winning, these kids are listening. They're sitting in over two and a half hours of church services. I mean, it's not all just playtime. I mean, look, to most people, that's extreme. To most people outside of our circle, I mean, that's extreme. But here's the thing. They love it. They love it. Why? Why? Look, here's my testimony. I hated church growing up. I went to a Lutheran church growing up, and I couldn't stand it. The church service. Because it was long, it was boring, and look, whenever we got to stay home for whatever reason from church, we were like... But look, the service itself, I still remember it, it was like torture. It was like torture. Two and, I mean, if you would have talked about, to, to me as a kid, that yeah, we're going to go to church for two and a half hours on a Sunday, I'd have run away from home. I mean, I'd have just been like, this is enough. I can't do it. But here's the thing. So what's different here? What's different here? Here's the difference, folks. Here's what's happening. Turn to Ephesians chapter 6. Turn to Ephesians chapter 6. What's happening here, and the reason it's not like that here, it's a beautiful thing. Let's take a look at it. Look at Ephesians chapter 6 in verse number 4. Probably a verse that you know well. But look. Look at, the, look at Ephesians 6, 4. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Now look. These kids are being brought up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Look, that's a beautiful thing. You say, what does that have to do with the fact that, you know, they love church? Well, just stay with me. Look, no matter how thing, how crazy things get out here, no matter how crazy things get out there, I told some of the guys it's quite possible that 2021 could get even stupider than 2020 at this point. I mean, but look, it doesn't matter because... At the end of the day, you know, we discuss these things, but at the end of the day, these kids are being brought up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Turn to Romans chapter 2. And look, ad admonition means counsel. Admonition means instruction. They're being brought up in the instruction of the Lord. And you see, for the kids, turn to Romans 2.14, for the kids... So we see they're, they're being brought up in the nurture and admonition in that instruction of the Lord. But here's the difference. The kids love it here because their consciences, the law written in their heart is undefiled. It's, it's not been messed with. It's, it's, it's pure. Look at Romans chapter 2 and look at verse number 14. The Bible here talks about that law written in everybody's heart. Remember, everybody gets this. Everybody starts with this. You say it's not fair. Well, everybody starts in their life with the conscience written in their heart. What they do with it at that point is, is a different story. Look at Romans 2.14. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, they did not have the oracles of God. They did not have the Bible. That was the advantage that the Jew had, remember? What advantage hath the Jew? Because he had the Bible. That's the advantage. But the Gentiles which they have not the law. They didn't have the Bible. Do by nature the things contained in the law. So it says they didn't, they didn't have the Bible, but they would still do things. They, they still knew that murder was wrong. They still knew that it was wrong to steal. Well, how? How? There's, no, there's nobody that told them. There was no Bible. They didn't have the oracles of God. They weren't Jews. They are a law. These having not the law are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts 
the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. So God wrote the law in everybody's heart, is what he's telling us here. And look, he's saying by the actions of the Gentiles, you can see it. You can see evidence of it. In the same manner also, these kids love church because as they grow in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, it matches their conscience. You see? That key fits perfectly into the undefiled conscience of their heart. Amen. Of that undefiled law in their heart. Look, do the kids have the knowledge of the law? No, they don't have the knowledge of everything, but they're going to grow in the nurture and instruction of the law. Right? And that key fits perfectly. Because there's, no, there's nothing broken there. There's nothing messed up there. The lock hasn't been smashed. It hasn't been, you know, torched or anything. And not, nothing's wrong with it. Look, so it matches. That, that's why they like it here. And it gives them confidence. And it builds. It nurtures them and it builds that conscience. And it, and it, it solidifies it. It's a beautiful thing. It gives them confidence. It gives them peace. And look, everybody's happy when they have peace. Look, it's the opposite. Turn to Psalm 119. Remember what we talked about this morning? We talked about that shipwrecked conscience. It's the opposite of that. It's the opposite of a shipwrecked conscience. It's a, it's a fortified hull. We're fortifying the hull of their conscience if we're talking about a ship instead of shipwrecking the thing. Look, turn to Psalm 119. Look what Psalm 19.1 says. The very first verse of this massive, longest chapter in the Bible talking about the love for the law. Look at verse 1. Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. That's what's happening. That's why the kids like it here. Because they're, because they're blessed. Because they're being blessed. Because they're, they're undefiled. And what's happening here is matching their conscience. It's building them up. And they're walking in the law of the Lord. And look, it's just going to get better. They're going to just love it more and more. Look, it's where kids, get, where kids get messed up is where their consciences are defiled. It's where, you know, through, through you know, God forbid, abuse or wicked influence in their life or, you know, I mean, just think about all the things that are out there, like the fornication, the drugs, the alcohol, terrible sins that, you know, people could just drag kids and young adults into. This is how, I mean, this is how you end up with, you know, imagine a teenager that would commit suicide. Your whole life's in front of you. It makes no logical sense. But this is, this is how it happens. It's, look, it's the opposite of what's happening here. It's the opposite. The world will take, the world is, it, it's almost, does it almost seem like there's an agenda to defile the conscience of children? Does it almost seem like, because there is an agenda to defile the conscience. We're building it here. We're strengthening it here. Because when these young men and these young ladies go out and they leave their parents' home and they get married and they go out into the world, guess what? They're on their own. Well, hopefully they're still in a good church, but they're going to have to withstand more than when they're being protected by their parents. That nurture needs to turn into strength. But look, the world is trying to tear all that down constantly. They're trying to break that conscience. They're trying to scar it. They're trying to mar it. And look, that's why you'll see with kids, you'll see with kids that have a heavy outside influence in their life. Look, maybe the teenager that has a heavy outside influence in his life, and then he gets saved, and then he gets in church. It, it's a more difficult path. You'll see that. You'll see that. I mean, praise God that they got saved in no matter what point in their life. But look, I mean, the church thing and the spiritual life, it just may not stick because there's been damage there. You see what I'm saying? You can, look, you can damage it. You can, I mean, that's why the Bible says it's been shipwrecked. You can shipwreck that thing. Try to fix, try to fix a, a, a boat that's been shipwrecked. 
difficult. It's a great analogy because it's difficult to fix. It's the same reason on homeschooling, by the way. I know we're talking about church, but one thing that I've asked for the last 10 or 15 years, whenever, and I, I used to do this when I would go and visit other churches, and we got a chance to meet other families and other, uh, and you know, m most decent churches should have uh, heavy homeschooling, if not all homeschooling, because they should be preaching that type of thing. But I would always ask homeschool kids, you know, hey, do you like being homeschooled? And like 100%, they, they, none of them would say, I want to go to public school. And the only time you will ever hear that you will ever hear that a kid wants to go to public school is if they were pulled out of public school and homeschooled when they're like a junior in high school. Then they might be like, yeah, I don't want to be homeschooled. I'd rather be in school. But why is that? It's because there's been damage there. There's, there's been shipwreck happen there. So look, it, it's the same thing with, with older kids. It's the same thing with church. It just may not, it just may not stick there because there's, there's already damage that's happened. I mean, the conscience, look, folks, the conscience itself is such, I mean, think about it. It's such a great gift. It, it's not salvation, but the conscience, everybody gets one. You could have a conscience and end up not getting saved and go to hell. But the conscience is that thing inside you. Everybody gets a life. Everybody gets a conscience. And some people with that find the Lord, some people don't. Some people reject it. But look, here's the thing. It's such a miracle and it's such a beautiful thing that, turn to 1 Timothy chapter 1, once it's damaged, it's an extremely hard situation. It's an extremely hard situation at that point. I can just read it for you. It's the verse we read this morning. Holding faith and a good conscience, and a good conscience, which some having put away concerning the faith, have made shipwreck. So it's saying, you know, the opposite of a good conscience, an undefiled and undamaged conscience, is this shipwrecked conscience. Look, this is why, by the way, this is why, you know, I don't know why this just popped in my head, but this is why this idea of the helicopter parent is so stupid. This is why these people that are, that they're going to find out that you homeschool your kids and that you go to church two or three times a week and that you go soul winning and the kids are in church all day and they're like, you're a helicopter parent. I mean, these people are morons. They don't even know what they're talking about. Yeah. I mean, look, look, we're not talking about, I mean, of course I'm a helicopter parent. I mean, what? What, what does it even mean? They're saying, oh, because hey, here's the thing, because their conscience is scarred and their conscience is damaged to the point where they think it's okay to have nothing to do with their own children. So they see somebody that has something to do with their children and is deeply involved in their children's life, and they're like, oh yeah, you know, we're going to come up with some term that is derogatory towards that. Because look, they want validation for what they're doing in their life. Look, we're not, I mean, helicopter parent. I mean, look, we're, we're involved. I mean, we're teaching these kids work. We're teaching these kids etiquette. We're teaching these kids character and integrity and honesty. I mean, all of these things, grace, mercy, all these biblical concepts. Yeah, I'm hovering over my kids, teaching them all these things. But you know what helicopter parent really means? It really means these people with this stupid idea that you need to expose your kids to the world and expose them to, you know what they're really talking about? They're really talking about exposing your kids to sin. And if you're going to sit here and you're going to tell me that I need to go and I need to expose my kids to sin, hey, burn in hell. You're never going to be around my family. Amen. I'm sorry, that's pretty strong language. But I mean, what are you trying to do to my kids? You're going to tell my kids that they need to go out and experience drunkenness? They need to go out and experience being a fornicator? Are you crazy? Get out of here. Amen. Don't ever, I mean, people like that, get them out. Get them out. Because those type of people, I mean, they're, they're, they're wanting to damage your children's conscience. They're wanting to defile what is pure, is what they're trying to do. They're want, they're, it's the exact opposite of what you're trying to accomplish here. It's the exact opposite of what's happening here. And look, once that thing is damaged, it's hard to fix, folks. It's hard to fix. I mean, how many, I mean, you, don't have, you could read secular books that tell you people are pretty much set in their ways once they're 25 or 30 years old. It's like a shipwreck on the rocks, you know? But that, look, 
That's all the world is trying to do is pull these children into darkness by what they watch, by what they see, by what they hear, by what they pull them into. So yeah, helicopter parent, just get out of here with that stuff. It angers me just thinking about it. So that, back to the whole point of the whole sermon. That, that's why they love it here. That's why they love it here. So the question, back at you, why don't you? Maybe you do, but why don't you if you don't? And the reason is, it's the same reason. It's the exact, end of sermon, let's pray. No, I'm just kidding. But look, it's the same reason. If you don't love spiritual things, it's the same exact reason that we were just talking about. It's a heart issue through what you've done, through what you've seen, through what you've experienced, through what you're doing, through what you're watching, through what you're experiencing. Through, it's, it's through the life that you're living, you're damaging your heart. And look, you can do permanent damage. Are you getting it? It's not just this, hey, I can do this for a while. You can do permanent damage to yourself. You can do permanent damage to yourself that will affect your future. I mean, hopefully you've not damaged it. I mean, for parents here, the motivation should be sufficient to get this right. I mean, because we, we talked about, you know, the serious consequences this morning. I mean, you must keep yourself from sin. Look, I really look forward to Sundays. I look forward to Wednesdays. I mean, I look forward to all of it. I'm not saying I don't have a bad day, okay? I'm not going to be some idealistic, you know, pretend like I'm a superhero. But, I mean, the point is, I, I look forward to Sundays here. I look forward to coming to church. Most people can't even imagine this. I mean, it's so foreign to people, this idea that we're going to go to church three services a week. You know, I'm going to go soul winning twice a week. I mean, most people look at my life from the outside. If people are looking at my life from the outside, they're just saying to themselves, wow, that's sad. That's sad that he thinks he has to do all that stuff. That's what people, you know, there's people that look at my life and they think that. Well, look, I, I've never been happier in my entire life. I've never had more joy in my life. But here's, here's the thing. I don't think I have to do these things. I like doing these things. And plus, it's serving the Lord. That's a bonus. Amen. That's a bonus. So with that in mind, do you know how dangerous it would be for me if I just started getting into some other stuff? If I just started, you know, maybe watching TV shows, maybe, I mean, you say, what's the big deal? Maybe I started listening to, oh, this just, you know, really? Rock music and all that's really all that bad. I just started listening to different music. I just started going places. Man, I just started enjoying the world a little bit. Just started, like, loosening up my standards. You know how dangerous that would be? That would, that would start, I would start, Look, I would start, you know, maybe I'm having fun doing that stuff. Maybe that stuff's fun. But here's the thing. I would stop enjoying these things. Because the, what do we talk about this morning? There's no gray. There's no gray area. You start moving in some direction. You, you, ever, you ever heard this analogy that you're never really, you're never really just on cruise control in the Christian life? That is so true. You're never just holding steady in the Christian life. You're either moving in the right direction or you're moving in the wrong direction. And the reason for that is, is because there's no gray area. It's because if you start moving in the wrong direction, eventually you're just going to be in the wrong place. And if you start moving in the right direction, eventually you're just going to be in a, in, a, in a great place. And look, there's no limit to the, by the way, there's no limit to the right direction. You start moving in the right direction and getting your heart right, and doors are just going to be open to you and open to you and open to you and open to you, and you'll do more for the Lord in your life than you ever thought you could imagine. I'm not, I'm not, did I say you're going to have a Mercedes and be a billionaire? No. I'm saying you're, you would do, you'll do more for the Lord than ever you could have ever thought you could. Amen. And that's 100% true. But you've got to be moving in the right direction. So you're never really just flatlining this thing. You can't really find a place. I'm going to put one foot over here, and I'm going to put one foot here. You're moving in the wrong direction. And you're going to end up in the wrong place. So look, it's dangerous. I mean, what, I mean, it's not, you see, it's not about forcing you to come here. 
It's not about, you know, threatening you with the Bible. You ever been in that church? You ever been, listen, you don't think I'm the best preacher in the world? Are you even saved? <laughs> what, you know, you're, you miss church on Wednesday? I don't know, I'm doubting your salvation. Look, that, this, the stu it's stupid. Amen. That's, that's, that's preschool stuff. Because it doesn't fix the problem anyway. It wouldn't fix the problem. I could sit here and look, I could get a maybe I could maybe I could be that type of, of preacher and I could get a church together and I could just scare you to death with your salvation every single Sunday. Maybe I'm just lame and that's the only way that I could get people to stay here is I could do that. Maybe that works, but look, what a terrible church that would be. I mean those I mean a bunch of fearful people that just like, you know, are just timid and like, am I even saved? I mean you ever heard of these people that have like been Baptist for like 15, 20 years and they're like, I don't even know if I'm saved. It's like, well, what in the world kind of church are you in? Yeah. Yep. You know, what in the world kind of church are you in? Man. I mean, what has that pastor done to you? Right. Where, you know, you know, am I even saved? Like, well, I don't know. Have you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ? Then you're saved. That's it. Amen. Did you ever do that one time? Probably. So look, that, that's not what this is about. It's about, look, it's a heart issue. Turn to Proverbs chapter 28. You're like, all right, my, my heart is hard. My heart is hard. What do I do? It's like, I get it. I understand what the problem is. We've identified it. I have a hard heart. Or my heart is, you know, hardened, and it's hardening, and I'm just not enjoying these spiritual things anymore. What do I do? What's the answer? Well, let's look at solving some problems here. Look at Proverbs chapter 28. Look at verse number 13. Look what the Bible says. Because, I mean, the Bible shows us the, the problem and it shows us the solution. That's the beauty of the Bible. Look at verse 13. He that covereth his sins shall not pro prosper. But whoso confesseth, confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. Happy is the man that feareth alway, but he that hardeneth his heart shall fall into mischief. I'm going to give you two solutions and they're both right here. The first thing is this. Get right with God. The first thing is get right with God. You say, I want to have, I want to have, turn to 1 John 1, 9. You say, I want to have a, a, a better heart. I want to enjoy coming here. I want to enjoy the spiritual things. Well, let me just help you. Let me just help you. I don't want to threaten you. This isn't about, look, if you don't like coming here, it's not about me and you. It's about you and your relationship with the Lord. That's what it is. Okay? And look, look at 1 John 1, 9. The Bible says this. So it says, he that covereth his sins shall not prosper. But the opposite of that is this, 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he that is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Look, do you, let me ask you this, do you confess your sins on a regular basis? Do you? I mean, look, we should not let, I mean, there's a lot of false doctrine. I heard this, this verse like maybe 80 million times in the Lutheran Church, all tied to salvation. This verse is not tied to salvation. This verse is talking about your relationship with the Lord, with your heavenly Father. It's talking about being right with God. So like, let's not let these things, remember the sermon series, things that have nothing, good things that are, have nothing to do with salvation? This is one of them. Confessing your sins is a good thing. It's not how you get saved, but it's a good thing to do. It's a good thing to do. Look. Don't let these things that have nothing to do with salvation give you such a bad taste in your mouth about them that you just don't do them. Confessing your sins. Get down on your knees and confess your sins and then turn from them. Amen. Amen. Repent of your sins. Everyone's like, ah. <laughs> No, repent of your sins. Confess your sins to the Lord and turn from your sins. You want to fix your heart, start there. Don't come, I mean, what's the opposite of that? The opposite of that is covering your sins. Is not admitting that you're sinning. Could you be saved and not admit that you're sinning? How many people do you know right now that do that? That are saved? I mean, everybody knows people like that. The first thing you need to do is stop covering your sins. And then you'll receive mercy. And look, the opposite of this in Proverbs 28 is that you have a hard heart. So you want to soften your heart, confess your sins, turn from your sins. Pretty simple. The next one is this. Fear the Lord. Fear the Lord. Look, folks, 
Fear is a decent motivator. Fear is a decent motivator. Realize, realize that you will pay a price for hardening your heart against the Lord. There's my threat. <laughs> but it's in the Bible. But look, you will pay a price for hardening your heart against God. So fear the Lord. I mean, look, you're, you're, not, a, you're not offending me by not liking coming to church and not, you know, I mean, I told my wife the other day, maybe two weeks ago, it was interesting, we had this conversation, but I said, I think maybe the hardest thing about the ministry is going to be, as I look forward, you know, maybe years forward and how this is going to go, I said, I think the hardest thing about the ministry, I, I told Heidi this, I said, I think the hardest thing is going to be, you're like, what's that going to be? The hardest thing is going to be watching people deal with the consequences of what they're doing. And the consequences aren't coming from me. The hardest thing about the ministry is going to be watching people suffer the consequences. Watching people's families suffer the consequences. That's going to be something that I'm not really looking forward to watching. My wife, she gave me some hope though. She said, yeah, she's like, but most of those types of people because there is no gray, remember? Most of those types of people will drop out. So you won't have to watch. And that's true. Most of those people will drop out of church. Look, it did, she didn't say that it's not going to happen. The consequences are coming. It's just that they won't be here anymore for me to see it. Because one of the first things or one of the things that happens along the way of that fall will be that they stop coming to church. And then at that point, the slope of the hill will go like that. Because there's no gray. It's not going to stay gray. You may be traveling through the gray zone on the way down, and you, you, know, you get out of church and you stop doing spiritual things, and then it's just, you're going to be in the wrong place. But back to my point. The fear of the Lord, turn to Psalm 86. The fear of the Lord it should be a decent motivator, right? I mean, well, here's, the thing, and here's, here's some irony for you. Everybody's scared of everything now. Can't you at least add the Lord to the list? I mean, okay, all right, all right. So you can't get to the place, you're just a huge coward, and you're afraid of everything, and you can't get to the place where you only fear the Lord, and the, th and the Lord is the only thing that you fear, because that's what the Bible says, but you just can't get there, because you're afraid of everything. Well, can you at least add them to the list? Can you at least add the Lord to, uh, to the list of things that you're afraid of? That's better than not fearing Him at all, and just being afraid of everything else. Look at Psalm 86 and verse number 11. Teach me thy way, O Lord. I will walk in thy truth. Unite my heart. This is the prayer right here. This is the prayer. Unite my heart to fear thy name. Like, I, I'm just, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not afraid of God. I'm not spiritual. I don't like coming to church. I'm in all this sin. I don't know what to do. Uh, ask God to unite your heart to fear his name. Read Psalm 86, 11. There's your answer. Ask God to unite your heart. Quit being afraid of all these other stupid things that you have no control of anyway. And just say, you know what? Unite my heart, Lord, so I fear you. And then when you fear the Lord, use that as a motivator to get you to do the right things. People are so afraid of everything today, it makes me sick. I mean, it makes me literally sick to my stomach to see how afraid Christians are of everything. If you don't fear the Lord, ask God to unite your heart to fear Him. And look, that's, I mean, this, this, isn't, this, this isn't on me. So I can, you know, I can just tell you these things. I can just cry aloud and spare not, and the rest is up to you. You know, here's, you know, here's another little testimonial for you, I, and I'm sure many of you have gone through the same thing. But I remember... I remember, so look, to end the last point, just the fear of the Lord should be something that's kicking you in the right direction. There is nothing wrong with that at all. Because it's true. If you don't fear the Lord, there's going to be consequences. If you don't do the right things, there's going to be consequences. But here's the thing. On this issue of, of spiritual matters, and especially the matter of coming to church, I remember the first time that I found hard preaching, that I heard hard preaching. 
well, on, on audio sermons or whatever. I wasn't in a church that had hard preaching. Look, I remember the first time that I heard hard Bible preaching. I couldn't get enough of it. I couldn't get enough of it. And I was just, I was ODing on this stuff. I was just constantly listening to this stuff. And it was just, you know, I mean, I was just, I was, I was blown away by it. And I mean, look, what was it talking about? It, all this hard Bible preaching, it was talking about me. It was talking about me. And look, I guess maybe I was just honest enough with myself to be like, yeah, you know, that is talking about me. I found and started listening to hard Bible preaching before I even got saved. And then that's what led me to seek out the truth in my life, and I ended up getting saved. I mean, look. So what's the next thing you think I did once I found this amazing thing? I mean, here I found this, this vault full of diamonds. I mean, I mean, what are you going to do? You're going to go tell everybody that you know. You're going to go tell everybody. You're going to be like, you guys got to listen to this. You're going to go tell your family. You're going to go tell your friends. You're going to go say, this, listen to this. Look at this vault full of diamonds. And now my wife had the same reaction as me. Of course, she was already saved. But, I mean, she thought it was great too. But here's the thing. Ninety-some percent of all the people that I told about it, they're like, meh. And I, eh. And I'm like, What? I'm like, what, what in the world? I mean, how is this possible? How could I, how could I want, never get enough of it and some people, it just doesn't even resonate at all? You ever had that experience? Of course you have. The problem is the key in the heart. It doesn't fit anymore. That's the problem. The problem is that there can be damage, there can be shipwreck to the point where that perfect key no longer fits. And I'm not saying that people are, you know, reprobate if they don't like hard preaching. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is, is that experiences in our life, the world, you know, you know, people getting defiled by things that they've seen, things that they've done, things that they've experienced, it can make them not even interested in the truth anymore. It can make them not even interested in the truth. And even if they do get saved, if, if that key can just get in there enough to, to get the gospel and they can get saved, there can still be enough damage there where they're just not going to do anything beyond that. And, and it's because there's been, there's been shipwreck. There's been shipwreck there. So look, church attendance, it, it, it's, a good, it's a good pressure gauge for you. It's a heart problem. It's all a heart problem. They didn't like hearing the truth from the Bible because their heart was wrong. Their heart was in a bad place. Their heart was damaged. Hopefully not permanently. But in those cases, you know, they, just, they didn't have that heart. They didn't have that perfect, pure conscience at that point. They didn't have that... I mean, the key doesn't fit anymore. So look, church attendance for you. Do you like coming to church? It's a pressure gauge. How's your reading? How's your reading? How's your, how's your, how's your PSI reading? Right here. Because you're like, you know, I just, I'm, I'm, I, I used to like it. I used to like it two months ago. I used to like it two months ago. Now I don't like it anymore. Well, find the problem. The root cause is your heart. The root cause is your heart. You know, unless something happened to you in the church or something, but you know, I mean, there's, there's ways to get through that stuff too. But the point is that it's always, it's, and the beauty of it is, is since it's a problem with your heart, it should be something that you can fix. It's, it's something that you can fix. So how's your, how's your heart this morning or this evening? You know, when it comes to uh, church attendance, just ask yourself that. Ask yourself that question. Because look, these kids, they're, they're a great base case for us. They're a great base case for us. You know, we know that their consciences are undefiled. We know that they're pure. And just look at how they react to this type of situation. It's, be, it's a beautiful thing. So if we're not reacting to that, we need to find that root cause. And it's somewhere in here. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.